Good evening and welcome. My name is Rebecca Griffin and I teach here in the language and literature department here at Cape Cod Community College. On behalf of the Creative Writing Club, the language and literature department, I'd like to welcome you to our fifth installment of the Bigger Boat Visiting Writers series at Four Seas. And I'd like to welcome Susanna Feltz, our featured reader for this evening. Welcome, Susanna. We, the organizers of Bigger Boat, hope that you are enjoy, enjoying these monthly readings. Thank you to Dean Kathy McCarran. Also, thank you to my co-organizers, Professor Tom Schaefer and Professor Michael Fournier, as well as Vanna Trudeau and Brian Rice for their help on the technical side. And thank you to all of you for coming this evening. So before we get started with Susanna's reading, I'd like to hand things over to Professor Tom Schaefer, who will be introducing our opening reader for tonight. Thank you. I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing to you uh, Eleanor Gubbins, who is not only in the Creative Writing Club, but she is also a member of our ENL 209 Creative Writing class this semester. Uh, Eleanor is going to read some poetry to you tonight. Um, she is somebody who has practiced very well in the art of poetry, but also fiction and creative nonfiction. So Eleanor, please take it away. Thank you so much, Professor Schaefer. So hello, everyone. My name is Eleanor Gubbins, and tonight I will be sharing three poems that I've written. Um, the first one is titled Home, and I wrote this um, as a prompt during my senior year poetry class, and I was uh, asked to write about a place that shaped me, and um, this is what came from it. I don't like being asked where home is. I'm obligated to say where I grew up, but the place doesn't feel right on my tongue. It sits funny, adjusting itself every few syllables. I wish I could say it didn't feel like betrayal. When I am asked where home is, I wish I could say it is the big tree that shades us on the hottest of days, where I sit absorbing its warmth the same way flowers do. do. It fuels us. I look down the road and find the shaded path towards the horses, where I first learned humility and hard work. Behind me is the pool, broken and loved as my memories here. I look towards the Navy model of the lighthouse, the water racing at the base. My heart is an overflowing fountain that I can't find the faucet to. When it gets quiet and we stargaze on the damp grass, waves crash just a block away and I wonder, how much love do you hold? What are your secrets and do you trust me enough to keep them? When people ask me where home is, I will do my best to describe the love within the wind, but I'd say I would prefer to show them. Find a map and measure the distance, count the steps it takes until we're settled, measure it in laughs, tears, or trees, find our way here. And if they still don't understand, I hope that they know, if I had the option, I'd prefer to never leave. And the second poem um, that I, I'm sharing is um, titled On Laying with the Moon, um, which is one of the most recent poems that I've written. On Laying with the Moon, Together in Heart. I gaze out my window at a time I should be sleeping, my eyesight grainy in the faint room. The lanky fingers of the trees trace through the sky, intertwining with the limbs of their partners. The light shines in through the windows whose shades I had forgotten to close, unbothered by the backdrop of a solitude sky. In the peaking craters of the moon, winking down at me, absorbing its light, hypnotizing me to a trance of rest that I haven't found since the last snow, until it happens again. For the first time since I've felt awake, the flurries have fallen and I breathe in again. What feels like the first time in the release of a past I no longer need to catch up to, not gasping for air that has already left me relaxed. The snow fills my lungs and I drift off into a new tomorrow. Uh, and lastly, this is a poem that I wrote um, my senior year on my way to school one day when I was riding the bus. Um, my music stopped, unsolicited by my headphones sitting gently in my ears and my hands neatly folded in my lap. It was raining that morning. I took this unforgiving pause as a chance to notice things, new things. I saw raindrops racing down windows, eventually connecting into one. Unification. 
That word felt heavy in my throat, making my mouth gape, but not enough for anyone to hear the words I was thinking. I noticed the branches scraping gently across the windows as his fingers once traced my skin, noticing the shape of the bones beneath the flesh. I got lost in the beauty of the gray sky at a time where the sun usually gave its golden glow. Street lamps reflected and illuminated the leftover raindrops from a storm before this one, showing residue and new marks that I don't remember being there. Abruptly, my music began again. My head unknowingly swaying to the beat as if being pulled by the conductor of a symphony. I was lost in a new way, at home with my loneliness and content with it before a new beginning. Thank you. That was beautiful, Eleanor. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd also like to say that uh, Eleanor is editor in chief of the Sea Change Literary and Arts magazine this semester as well. Um, and she's doing a great job steering her small but mighty crew through this process. And we can look forward to, with great anticipation to the publication of the magazine at the end of spring semester. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading, Eleanor. Thank you. Right, so from here. I'd like to introduce our featured reader for tonight, Susanna Feltz. I met Susanna in her hometown of Nashville, a place my husband Mike and I love to visit from time to time. During one visit about six or seven years ago, Mike scored a reading hosted by Susanna and her husband Todd Dills. The reading was held on their screened in back porch. Guests sat in chairs that Susanna and Todd had pulled from around their lovely arts and crafts style home. The atmosphere was relaxed, and as each reader took a turn, uh, each reader took a turn. After the evening, uh, after the reading, guests stayed late into the summer evening getting to know each other. Throughout the night, a topic came up over and over again, and that topic was, how does one live a creative life in today's world? And what I learned that night about Susanna's approach to this question made a lasting impression. She's not only a working writer, she and her colleague, Katie McDougall, have also founded a community-based nonprofit writing collective. The writing center is called, fittingly, The Porch. Like Grub Street in Boston, the pur purpose of The Porch is to give writers in Nashville a way to take classes, attend retreats, and seek out other writers. In the years since that night, The Porch has grown from a fledgling nonprofit into an indispensable Nashville institution, offering affordable workshops for writers of all ages and levels of writing experience. The Porch sponsors a host of cool projects, including Poetry on Demand, which sends poets out into the community to interview strangers and turn their stories into poems. The Porch also offers free workshops for writers in the immigrant and refugee community to help them tell their stories. As the hub of Nashville's literary arts scene, The Porch is an inspiration to all creative writing community efforts, including Bigger Boat. Susanna's community outreach is only one facet of her impressive career as a writer, teacher, and editor. She has been awarded the Tennessee Arts Commission's Individual Artist Fellowship in Fiction, and her work has appeared in too many publications to mention including the Best American Science and Nature Writing 2018, Guernica, Catapult, and The Oxford American. Her first novel, This Will Go Down on Your Permanent Record, was published by Featherproof Books. She is currently seeking representation for a second novel. Welcome, Susanna Feltz. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was truly probably the nicest introduction I've ever had. I almost started crying. Um, just remembering, I, I'm so glad you painted the picture of that visit. Um, Cause gosh, I have a terrible memory. And so these things kind of like disappear and then to be rem reminded that, oh, that was an amazing time. And then we went to Dino's I think after, and I don't know, it was just a really nice night. And the fact that you, Pick, you pinpointed that we talked a lot about how to live a creative life. Just, I think that's what almost sent me the over the edge because that's really, that's sort of the biggest um, thematic sort of um, ring 
of the the new book um, that I'm trying to find and you know an agent for. So um, thank you for that, and thank you uh, to Tom and to Michael and to everybody at Cape Cod Community College. I love that it's the four C's. I, that's such a cool thing to be able to say the four C's. Um, thank you all for having me. It's a super fun honor. Um, so I thought I would. Uh, read from the new book tonight and I'm just going to start at the very beginning and um, the uh, my elevator pitch for the book is that it's lately has been that it's a um, prodigal daughter story um, it's about a prodigal daughter her life in music and her relationship with her complicated father um, at other times I've called it sort of a mashup between a prodigal daughter story and a rock novel um, that's kind of another, the, the rock part of it is a big element. Um, it's called The Come Apart. And um, so I'm going to just start at the beginning. Um, there is a short section that takes place in February 2010. And then there will be another section that is actually six months earlier in uh, September of 2009. Okay. Maggie Sparrow doesn't stop until she's 300 miles south of Chicago, winter trailing her like a banshee. Wind howled across the Indiana fields, shoved at her old car on the straightaways. She sliced through Kentucky on I-65 with the heat cranked high. A truck stop, floodlit in the dawn, a place that is no place, and yet one Maggie knows well after all the van tours, the club gigs, the house shows, how many thousands of miles but this morning there's no boys, no big owl, the band's old green econoline, no band, just Maggie solo and her smashed up Corolla, its front bumper threatening to fall right off. In her backpack, there's a couple wads of cash. She'd stood heart pounding in an ATM in the middle of the night after escaping the show and busting up the car. Logged into the band's account, did some quick figuring and left them the balance she felt they deserved. From the apartment, she grabbed only the treasures and necessities. She'd spun around, wild-eyed, knowing Matt could return any minute. Now here in the back seat, along for this stupid ride, are trash bags of clothes and journals, her scrapbooks, the laptop she and Matt had shared. But she'd paid for it, hadn't she? He said he would give her half, but that never happened, and at the time, it didn't seem worth hounding him. Fair enough. Now it was hers to take. And in the back seat too rests her good old Gibson SG and a few pedals. She wasn't leaving these behind for anyone else's fingers and toes, even if music was over for her. She pictures Matt back in Chicago, a city she learned to call home, her landing pad for a decade. He's pacing the apartment or he's slouched on the sofa. Either way, he's checking his phone. Leaving like this would be easier if he were an egomaniacal asshole but brilliant and driven is what he is. And he'll go on being that without her. He'll book more gigs with a new project, no longer hush hush. And his fans, they'll follow. She'll resent him for making her leave, but he'll say nobody forced her, which will only make her resent him more. There are missed calls and texts from Matt and from her friend, Devin. Matt must have called Devin trying to figure out where Maggie was. But the last Devin had seen Maggie was at the Groupon party. She would know nothing. There's also a voicemail from Nashville. Hey, my name's Frank. I'm the one with the room for rent. When Frank gives his address, Maggie hears only a gloss of drawl, nothing too thick. She takes it as a good sign and in the same beat hates herself a little more for judging a Southern accent that way, for judging a person that way. What has she become? She has to call this Frank back. But first, a quick trip to the belly of gas station land. Inside, everything's loud and invisible at the same time. Some bro country hit assaults her from hidden speakers. Energy shots and bear claws, pat pastries trapped in plastic. Maggie finds the duct tape. When has this stuff ever failed her? And visits the coffee station. She pours the cream first, the way Matt did it. Saves a stir. She hears him saying that. The first time she saw him do it, during a slow shift at Holfax that time before they first hooked up, when he stopped by presumably, presumably to get coffee, but quite obviously to shoot the shit with her, she thought, genius. She pays for her tape and coffee, 
And at the exit, there's a two note electric chime meant as a warning that someone is coming or going. It's a horrible sound, but in the before, Maggie might've jumped on an idea right then and made the bad thing good. She might've taken that no good, very bad bing bong, recorded it on her phone, run it through effects, braided it with a beat, transformed the whole weird package into a bridge. And if the song sucked, at least it'd lead her down another possibly better path, but it's too late. The Spinning Bird's second album might still get made, but not with her and not with her voice. And her lyrics, the song's already written, she can't even think about what to do about that. Morning is broken, the snow tapering to a spit. Her wrecked front bumper hangs low. She squats, tears the shrink wrap from the roll of tape, pushes the sagging end of the bumper and holds it in place with her knee, slaps down a length of tape. Then another and another lined up like teeth. The noise the tape makes when it unrolls, rips free from itself, she likes that. Always this attunement to sound, to the chance of a song, a lyric, a note that needed sustaining, she could find it anywhere. Now she's on the run from the life she once chased in the opposite direction, believing it was the only pure way. 10 years ago, she made this trip in the same car, Nashville to Chicago. She was leaving home to make music her life. And she did, a popped timeline of a life, but no one can say she did not. Maggie kips, kicks the bumper, testing it. It sags less, but the duct tape is slipping against the surface. She slaps more down. For a long time, it seemed enough to keep moving. Here you are, she thinks, moving, but for what? She almost wants to scream it out loud to startle the man pumping gas at the next bay. Still driving the car your dad bought all those years ago, still carrying around the SG, a long ago gift from him too when you were just a kid. A gift meant you understood only much later as blessings for an avocation, a word your father loved to throw around. Later, when he said you were crazy for quitting school and doing the band thing, you thought about selling the SG, and buying your own damn guitar but you couldn't do it. Now your dad, the estimable Don Sparrow, he's dead and gone, snuffed out in a blink, that old messy heart of his, his worst enemy at last. And maybe you've been speeding headlong into the dark too, note by note. The windshield wipers jerk into action when Maggie cranks up the car, but there's not enough wet. So they sing out in protest, a rhythmic grunt, a tantrum. Maggie kind of likes the clop they make on either end, but she puts the wipers out in their misery and ponders calling dog treat. Part of her wants to let him, know, let him know where she is, even what she did. She wants to know what he might say, come back, where are you? Are you nuts? But he wouldn't say any of those things because he's certainly fast asleep. Instead, she returns Frank with the room for rent's call. To her surprise, he picks up. No one picks up anymore, especially not this early. This might sound strange, she says, but I need to know if you play music. This Frank, he doesn't miss a beat. He says, yes, he plays gigs here and there. Fiddle, session work mostly. Hops on a few tours every so often, plays keys in a friend's kitty band. Tunes for tots, puns and animal jokes and cowbell. They go wild. Tunes for tots, he's no Matt Turkish and he's not ripped from the playbook of her life and men before Matt. Those boys wouldn't know how to sing the ABCs. You play, he asks. Maggie can't answer that. The give in, the give up, it's too much. Her mother, if Maggie called her, would say, you can stay here as long as you want, which is why she has not. She ducks the question and tells Frank she's interested. She'll be there before noon. Back on the road, still thinking about her dad, she finds a classic rock station. Don Sparrow loved the 70s Titans of Rock, loved him some petty. He played her all those records until it became her thing too. One more, he'd say when he sensed he was losing her. Just listen to this one, Maggie Mae. He'd watch her while the music played. Now I know you may not really follow what I'm getting at here, but, and then he'd tell her, he'd talk her through the verses. Jangly guitars, a brisk beat, clap track, the black background vocals bringing it all together, make it last all night. She has to admit she loves the song, maybe as much as her dad did. So turn it up, Maggie, 
you know what to do. Loud enough that you can't hear anything it might mean to you or anyone else. Loud enough that you can hear only its pure power, those chords and that nonstop beat, how it all makes the miles fly by. Three hours and you're home. So the next section is six months earlier. Maggie's on tour with her band, Spinning Birds. This is September, 2009. Maggie veered off the interstate in search of a bathroom, settling for one of the sketchier specimens of gas station land. The band was cutting it too close for a 5 p.m. sound check, with the telltale cramping of her irritable gut qualified as an emergency. They were becoming too familiar, these emergencies, these pit stops at questionable establishments. It was nothing she discussed openly, but there was no being cagey about your body on tour. While she hightailed it to the ladies, the other members of Spinning Birds made themselves scarce. It seemed impossible how they could drift away at a gas up in the middle of nowhere, but drift they did. Any opportunity to smoke, to buy more snacks, to make a call in private, they'd take it. Once she was back in the van, they were nowhere to be found. Vamoost. Cicadas were screaming, a rhythmic drone that seemed the sonic equivalent of thick summer heat. Sweat ran down Maggie's back. She'd already tidied Big Al, gathering soda cans and jerky wrappers the flotsam of the floorboard. Now she wished she could run back inside and wash her hands again, splash her face in pits. They'd managed what, maybe four showers over the last two weeks? But here was Matt, exiting the convenience mart, holding the door open for a mom and her two kids. He was on the phone. He lingered there, finishing his call. He had the fancy water she'd asked him to get, but no bugles. Maggie liked observing him this way from a distance. He wasn't famous, not in any real way, not outside of a certain artsy Chicago circle, but a stranger might sense a presence, a possibility in the bounce of his gait. Now she watched him approach the van, pale and rangy, not unlike the way she had watched others watching him and not unlike the way she'd often been watched. She knew that, spec she knew that speculative gaze too, the weight of eyes. They had been on the road for two weeks, a short Midwest circuit, 11 gigs, 13 nights. The shows had been booked in early June, summer green with promise, all four of them with high hopes. But the crowds were thin and ill-tempered. A fight broke out at a house show in Cleveland, which was not a thing that happened at Spinning Bird shows. The places they crashed were even filthier than usual, usual. Big Al's AC crapped out again, and all along Maggie's gut and its occasional hissy fits. That was Kim checking in, Matt said, climbing back in, the van, black, back in the van. He handed her the water and she cracked it open. Ah, where are the bugles? No bugles. No way. I looked. They were out. Here, have some fancy water, she said, passing him the bottle. This tour is definitely cursed. I swear they were out. Bugles might have been a bad idea, though, given your, you know, he patted his stomach. No, no, it was those tacos in Michigan City. Bugles are never a bad idea. What'd Kim say? She said she liked trees could talk, but she's heard it. Maggie watched Matt's Adam's apple bob as he drank. Kim Crane was their point of contact at the label. She'd been the one to champion their debut album, Murmuration, and as one of the junior reps, its success was a, was a feather in her cap too. She'd worked hard to see that the label gave them what they needed to support the record and had thrown them a few bones for the next one too. They had promised her a few demos last spring, but the new songs weren't ready in April. They weren't ready in June. Here it was deep August and the songs were at best amoebic, except for the one track where they made some progress. But Maggie and Matt couldn't agree on what direction to go with Trees Could Talk. She liked the idea of keeping it stripped down and slow, emphasis on the vocal harmonies. While Matt had gone for a lush multi-track sound, maybe some strings on the bridge and more up tempo. Look, I sent it to her before we went out. Please don't freak. She took the water from him. Matt, you know I don't feel ready yet. The lyrics still aren't all there and we haven't decided you sent it to her without telling me. She dug it as the important thing. He ran a hand through his hair, which stood up in thick tufts. And she played it for the other guys and they were into it. So let's focus on that. The bones are good. I just wanted to give her something since it's been a while. Nothing is in stone. We'll work on it when we get back. Just relax. When did you do this? Before we went out, like I said, she's been on vacation. She just listened. 
Do you want me to drive? I could take this last leg. No, I'm fine. Why don't you take a break? You've been driving all day. No, I'm driving. If we ever get out of here, where the hell are Clint and Dog? Why do they have to vamoose every single time we stop? I'm right here, a voice called from the back. Jesus, Maggie said. Dog, man, don't spook me like that. I was just reclining. He held up a fat paperback, reading. His real name was Brian Daughtry, but he was dog treat or dog or treat from the moment they met him. Maggie had misheard his name beneath the din of a crowded bar. It was like this often, a bond or a code cleaved from mistake, the rightness of the thing inseparable from its wrongness. All good stuff came from the bad or so went their shared and silent philosophy. Great, so now we're just down Clint, she said. Had Dog heard them arguing? She glanced at Matt, flipping through his notebook, looking for something. He was licking his finger between every page. He could be such a little old man. Maggie had ginned up this tour as an effort to get things back on track. Ideas could come easy when they were crammed together in a small space, exhausted and wired. In the middle of all those long highway hours, there could be bursts. A tossed, a tossed off line might spark another line. A joke could become something serious. Between gigs, they had nothing but time, and time could be everything. She tried not to worry, but the annals of rock gave you so many good, bads gone, good bands gone bad. Some the business killed, some did themselves in. Take Barton Tender, a Portland five piece whose dopey name should have presaged their eventual decline. They put out two albums packed with tight, smart, hook stacked pop songs, earwormy numbers that had earned a notch on a generational soundtrack. But what was this dreck they'd put out after that? Record three was horseshit, as if the band had undergone a terrible brainwashing. Could it happen to anyone? What if Spinning Bird's second effort was uneven, as uneven as second efforts had a habit of being? What if they started making terrible music and couldn't see it? What if they failed to make any more music at all? Where the fuck is Clint? If Maggie had to guess, he'd prowled into the scrub behind the station to piss. He had a thing about restrooms and germs. They'd have given him all kinds of hell for it if he were anyone other than Clint. A species of well-disguised, delicate creature, they knew how to handle him. When at last he appeared, several sticks of beef jerky in his fist, she cranked the engine. They were 45 minutes north of Louisville, running against the clock for a 5 p.m. sound check, final show of tour. He hauled the door shut. I thought Matt was gonna drive this last stretch. Maggie knew he didn't care who drove. He just couldn't bear not to take a dig. She flipped him a bird and threw Big Al in reverse. Sit back, she said, and eat your beef stick. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Susanna. Those, the Thank way you. that you write just brings you right into the moment. And I, I'd love to hear more about Maggie's life on the road and live a little vicariously through her. <laughs> so, um, I want to have us move into the question and answer portion of the um, reading, but before that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and to um, announce our next Bigger Boat reading, which is uh, April 1st. It's going to feature poet Paul Guest. And then looking ahead, Bigger Boat, along with the Intentional Critical Conversation speaker series, will welcome world-renowned poet Martin Espada on April 22nd, that's Earth Day. That reading is gonna be a little bit earlier than our um, normal readings. It's gonna be at two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so please stay tuned for more information on these upcoming events. So back to, back to the question and answer portion of our reading. Uh, attendees, if you could please post your questions in the chat window and be sure to address your questions directly to me, Rebecca Griffin, uh, when you write in the chat. And while people are formulating their questions, I'll start us off by asking the first question. Uh, and Susanna, this is the same question that we've asked all of our bigger boat readers since the series began. Um, how has your writing life been affected by the advent of COVID? The advent of COVID, that's <laughs> such an interesting way of putting it. Um, let's see. I feel like my writing life has not been as affected by the pandemic year as some other aspects of my life, perhaps. Um, partly because I was in and my my I was in this late stages of revising um, this book, or at least for now. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But um, in the early part of 2020. And then um, I think because I 
was in those stages and I knew the story, like I wasn't trying to create brand new material. It was actually really, uh, it was a nice place for me to go. So I was able to kind of go into this world, work on what was already there. Like it, it felt like a respite or it felt like a, a refuge um, to go and to work on it. And so I was able to, you know, revise it through 2020. Um, and I was really thankful that that's what I was doing versus trying to start a new project or like plow through the middle, the murky middle of a, of a big project, which I think would have been very hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. So I have a follow-up question. It's kind of related. Um, and I, I want to read an excerpt from your uh, essay, Dispatch from a Pandemic. Oh yeah. Nashville, if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And it's just so fitting because it's been, this is, we're coming up on the year anniversary or we were right, right there actually of uh, when everything changed. Um, and this was published in another Chicago magazine back in May. And you write about the sound of the pandemic. And I just, this resonated with me a lot. So I'm going to read this. So um, you say that the sound of pandemic is the sound of silence, empty restaurants, stores, and streets. But in all that quiet, I'm tuned to the tender punctuations, the noises of quarantine making themselves familiar as the hours tick by. The gas logs hiss in the fireplace. My 11 year old idly thumbs the page corners of a book. When she tires of reading, she comes over to burp in my ear. Then she kisses me gently on the forehead. Mama, what time is it? Is her constant refrain. I hear it no less than 10 times a day. And it's just such a quiet and almost meditative piece of writing. And it really resonates with the kind of oddness of the early pandemic and how you kind of would notice things. Um, can you talk about what prompted that piece of writing and what you think about now in retrospect, looking back on that, those early days? Yeah, I can't remember what prompted it other than you know a writer's mind is always kind of spinning and you're always trying to or at least my writer's mind is always thinking I want to I want to recollect this in some way and I knew as we all did that this was a really unfor you know this was a moment that we were going to carry with us the rest of our lives and I wanted to be sure that in some way I I recorded that for myself because as I mentioned before my memory is actually really shoddy and so things just kind of tend to go in and out and so I I was just hell-bent on documenting in some way the things that I was noticing at that time yeah and it was I think maybe because I've been working on this book about a musician for so long you know where sound is very much a part of it I think I was especially thinking about sounds I loved how you mentioned the sound of the duct tape ripping. I've done that <laughs> my before, and so that is kind of resonant. Yeah, right. resonated with me. Yeah, um, you have a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, this is from uh, Dean McCarran. She says uh, you write beautifully, but use relatively few multisyllabic words. Is this um, is this concentration on one and two syllable words rooted in your love of music? What a good question. That's a great question. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that it's probably, that probably has something to do with it that I'm not even aware of consciously. Um, and I mean, I'm definitely, but I definitely think in writing this book and, and all, in all writing, I am very um, paying a lot of attention to how the words sound together on the page, like kind of leaning towards poetry in that way, I would, I would hope. Um, it, may, it means a lot to me and I think a lot about it. I, I, I tend to think, you know, I, it, there's no rules that can't be broken in writing and there's no, there's no one way of doing things, but I do feel like um, simple words, not necessarily monosyllabic, but le less Latinate, um, more Germanic. I mean, I, I tend to feel like they're power words. They feel strong. Um, I probably go through my writing looking for multisyllabic words to weed out in a lot of cases. So that's probably a partly a, a, a due to revision and partly, yeah, maybe I love the idea that it might come from music. I don't know, I, that's, that's intriguing. Um, I have another question from Jade Francis uh, who would like to know how you chose a publisher for your first book. My first book, well, I didn't really, <laughs> so I, I was just telling my daughter this story today. This is funny because she's actually, she's 12 and she's reading that book, that first book that came out so long ago, um, and uh, which is really fun. And 
I was telling her how, you know, I had an agent for that book and uh, he tried to sell it to a number of New York publishers and it was a YA novel and uh, they all turned it down. So at that point I was kind of like, well, I guess I'm done with this. But then I had some friends who at that time were starting up a small press called Featherproof. And um, they were like, well, we'd like to take a look at it if you don't mind. And I was like, sure. Um, so they ended up publishing it and Featherproof and it was, maybe their fourth or fifth title at that point. My husband actually has a book with them too. Um, but this, they're still around today, which is great to say. Um, they're still doing very, very idiosyncratic books. Um, so I kind of lucked into it, I guess you could say. It's kind of about having a writerly community though. Um, you have a, a network, a community around you and sometimes things can, can work out that way. Mm. Do you have advice for writers who like, because you also teach writing, yeah. um, what do you tell them about uh, that process? About publishing, publishing or, yeah. Yeah. well, it's, it's the least fun. I, I don't know. I don't want to be negative. It's not, I think it's, the, it's one of the harder, um, more psychically challenging parts of the writing life is the publishing end of things. And I, my, my big soapbox thing now with, with all writers, with young writers, with anyone is to just really focus on um, making writing a practice in your life, like recognizing the value that it has for you as a human being, that it has for your brain, that it has for you just as something that nourishes you. And, um, you know, that's not to say you don't, I mean, obviously I've got stuff on submission right now. I'm trying to find a, a an agent for this novel, but um, if you have that in place, if you have that attitude towards the work, the rest of it's going to be a lot easier to, to kind of stick with and to persevere with, because it takes a lot of perseverance. It takes a lot of um, being told no repeatedly over and over and over and over again. And you just kind of have to develop a very thick skin and um, get used to that and know that that's part of the game, that you're playing a game and that it's, in a lot of ways, it's a numbers game um, where, you know, you've just got to get your stuff out there to a lot of different, whether it's submitting to literary magazines or even to agents, you're probably going to have to cast a very wide net, I think, most people, not everyone, every story is a little different, um, but you're going to have to try a bunch of times. So um, part of that is just, is the perseverance and the tenacity. Um, and that is all made easier by A, thinking of writing as a practice and B, having a um, writing community around you that lifts you up and makes you feel like this is, this is my world, you know, that's what matters. How, I, I'm especially interested in this question, the answer to this question right now, because I guess because so many of us are working at home, um, mm -hmm. when you think about writing as a practice, as someone who, is, for, for you writing is a practice, mm -hmm. At the same time as you're, you have a child at home and you're you're doing um, the, the the organizing the, the porch and keeping that going, and you have just a lot of different things going on. How do you organize that and then also like put the practice of writing and as make sure that that remains a part of what you do from day to day? Well, it's changed a lot over the years, and there were definitely times in my life where I wasn't doing that at all. Um, it just, I wasn't nourishing my writing life, and I was struggling, and I didn't, I felt bad because of it. It just like, you know, it's just like when you know you're not doing something that would make you feel better, when you're not, not taking the pills you should be taking or whatever, it's kind of like that. Um, you know, when my kid was smaller, um, anybody out there with very small children, that's a very hard time um, to keep up a writing life, and so you just know that it's it's not forever and it's actually a very short amount of time um, in the end. So you just, you know, kind of power through and try to try to have, hopefully have a good relationship with your partner if there is a partner so that they can kind of give you some spaces, make some spaces in your life for your own work. Um, but these days, you know, my kid is 12, so she's, you know, pretty much fending for herself. <laughs> and my husband is, um, he's great. You know, I mean, he, he does a lot of things. It's wonderful. I'm very lucky. So, um, I, I don't write every day, you know, by no means, I don't think I've been able to work on my stuff this entire, this has been a very busy week, but I, I do, I am trying to, um, do a little bit of writing first thing in the morning. Um, not early, I'm not super, super early bird, but I just try to 
as much as I possibly can. Let this be, let my own writing be the first thing that I do in the morning when I sit down before I get onto porch work, basically. And it's usually about 25 minutes, um, 25 to 30 minutes. I actually have this little app on my phone. It's called the Bear Focus Timer. And it's, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pomodoro technique. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, the, it's, it's an app based around that. And so I set my little bear focus timer for 25 minutes. And then I, I actually have developed some rituals that I kind of go through. It's a little woo woo, but I love it. I have been drawing sigils. I won't try to get into what <laughs> all that is, but um, I'll draw a sigil and then I will trace it and then I'll set my timer. And then it's just, there's like a little pivot buffer between the other world and the writing world. And that all, that's only like five minutes, right? So if you can just do this little buffer thing, this little ritual that resets your brain to be like, this is, this is writing time. I think that's an easy, that gets you ready, especially if you do it over and over and over again, if you do it hopefully close to daily, you, your brain is sort of trained to be like, okay, that's what we're doing now, we're writing. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do now. And it's been pretty successful, but like I said, this week it hasn't been. So, you know, um, that is so, what you can. that's just so helpful to know that, that that's the way that you get into the process because it's so easy just to get so distracted and that you go, have the ritual that kind of focuses you. I think that could be just so helpful for, for people. Yeah. Or even just reading. So like we, we talked to Simon Hahn recently, this uh, debut novelist who, um, he said, you know, his thing, his ritual is just to read a book that's re some really good literature for like a few minutes before he starts to write, other than scrolling Twitter or Facebook or whatever, which is just treats his brain in a different way. So he, when he sits down, he just reads a few pages of something that's like a good book that he likes. And he's like, okay, now I'm in the zone. You know? mm -hmm. So whatever it is, do it. Yeah, that's great. And I like that you're also saying that social media, because that's, I think that's what we think of first a lot of times, even though we shouldn't. And yeah, oh, always. Get, I yeah. mean, it's hard to stay away. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, so let me see, I have a couple of questions. Let's see, <laughs> a few things came in. Um, so this isn't a question, but uh, Carrie Drone wants to, he's a professor here, says that he, uh, no questions, but loved this Frank reference and Frank with the room for rent. It gave instant power to the character. I knew him right away. Um, bet we have all met him, he says. And uh, I wonder what he thinks Frank is like, because there's, yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, um, Michael Fournier would like to know to what extent uh, your writing about rock music and bands was uh, based on writing about youth. To what extent is writing about rock music and bands writing about youth? Yeah. Well, I don't know if P means like my youth. Hmm. Um, Did you mean? Like my lived experience in youth. Uh, also, how much is dealing with the bureaucracy of grants and wait. That's a different question. <laughs> different question, same person, but he's following up now. Okay. Yeah. Just youth in general, what is it about youth in general? I asked the question because after a certain point, being a band and playing music seems to be a thing that falls off when other concerns become more pressing. Yeah, well, I think it's that's part of the, the story is that this character is 29, you know, she's been in bands for her entire 20s. And so she really is at that point where it's like, am I going to keep trying to do this, like make this my life? This is maybe really hard to, you know, you see it's, it's common, right? It's, it's, you know, oh, yeah. people, that's when they kind of say, um, and, and so in the book, you know, she's got ex band, you know, other former bandmates who are getting married and having kids and, you know, so it's very, yeah, I think it's about transition points in between this. Um, but then also trying to, you know, ask that question of like, creativity doesn't belong just to the young, right? It, it shouldn't. Uh, making a life as a, you know, that's, that's, I think, one of those questions of making life, making a life in art. I think so many people give up the idea of making a life in art because when they are no longer young, because it doesn't seem feasible anymore um, in capitalist, in a capitalist economy. And you just can't, right? Like you have to earn, you know, you have to do something that will earn you more money. Um, so yeah, I mean, it probably is about youth in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but it also sounds like it doesn't have to be about you making art. Really, the point is like it doesn't have to be about youth, is what you're saying too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. ideally, you know, you keep you keep at it, you find a way, but it's so it's so hard, and so most people don't, or you know, or when they do, it's fascinating to me. You know, it's like how do people manage to keep an artistic practice of any kind like central to their lives? I I'm endlessly interested in that. Uh, Tom Schaefer, Professor Tom Schaefer would like to know about dialogue uh, as a writer. So do you feel that dialogue in writing is an easy part or a difficult part? What kind of advice can you offer young writers about mm -hmm. dialogue in a story? I think some people have a flair for it. You know, it's, it is like it's, it can come easily or it can be extremely difficult. I find that I rewrite dialogue a lot and um, it's just, I often, it often goes from, it, it narrows down, you know, like there's a lot of it or it's way too long passages and they, they get whittled. And even in this, like reading this passage, I'm like, I had to read it sort of, sort of differently than it is on the page almost, to, not too much, but um, I hear voices. I mean, I definitely hear the voices in my head as the characters are speaking. And I try to, I try to create that on the page. Um, but that's dangerous because dialogue is not, good dialogue of course is not like transcribed speech, right? Um, it's its own thing, um, it's its own little craft. So um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of trial and error just like there is with, with all, the, all the pieces of, of a piece of prose. Um, but definitely I think it goes from like more to less most often. And I have to just fight my own tendencies to make it too voice, to make it too, too much like spoken language. So. Um, we have one more question so far, unless, unless somebody else uh, writes in, but uh, the question is, and this is from, from Mike, um, how much is dealing with the bureaucracy of grants and whatnot for the port similar to the slog of trying to get a manuscript published? <laughs> Great question. Um, it's actually not, I don't feel like it's as similar as you might think, only because at this point, maybe it was in the very beginning um, of the porch when Katie and I were doing all the grant applications ourselves. Um, there's less, I mean, you, you do get told, told no. It's a similar thing where you put all this work into it and you send it out and you hope for the best and then you get a no. And that's just the way, that's just the way it goes and then you try again. So that part is very similar. But there's not the the um, the scale is different. You're not sending out like 30 grant submissions the way you might send out 30 literate. 30, you might send a story to 30 magazines before it gets picked up. Like that's just not happening. You're not. You might send a grant one year to one place and get told no, and then you send it the next year and you get told yes. You know. I mean, it's so um, there are no's to deal with, and you learn from your mistakes. Um, but in the more recent years, we've actually been able to hire a, um, a de development consultant, basically like a grant writer who helps us. Like we had already kind of put the narratives together for some of the first years of grants. She was able to take that information and now she kind of plugs that in to the grants that have mostly we've, some of them we've received before and some of them we haven't, like she's found those applications for us. And she puts those in and you know updates according to whatever new material we have and does all the, the budgeting part of it is the is the really headachey part for me, the part that has the numbers in it. <laughs> so I'm very happy to say that we're at the point where we have somebody to help us with that. But mm. it's kind of different actually. Yeah. Two different processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you got into this to teach creative writing and be kind of part of that community. Silly me. <laughs> <laughs> then yeah. you're dealing with numbers and grants and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it has, are, you're mostly remote. It looks like now all your classes are offered remote through the port. Yeah, right now they have been since last March and we'll probably, we're talking about having some in-person classes this summer actually, but we don't know. Yeah. We're just kind of waiting to see, but there's a, there's this chance we might have a few in person this summer. And then I think in the fall, we will continue to have online classes from now now from now on because it has been actually a really good thing. Um, but we will I'm I'm hoping that in the fall we will be able to do a mix of the two. And now we're like 
trying to figure out how we might do hybrid classes. And that's just a whole other, I don't know, we don't know what to do there. So we'll have to figure it out. Yeah, we're having kind of similar conversations here, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Do you guys have hybrid classes already? Um, or, or did you in the past, in the before times? Yeah, yeah. You did. Online, okay. and yeah, some online, a portion would be online and the portion would be um, in person. Yeah, Mike saw a couple of them. So like, was there a camera and the, would there, like in the in-person times, like when the students were in the classroom, was there also, were there, would there also be sort of people remotely watching somehow? Or was it more like, you well, in the times in the times before, uh, actually, Tom Schaefer was doing some of the Zoom stuff early on with uh, students who lived out on the was it Martha's Vineyard or um, Nantucket? Nantucket. Because of the we can talk, we can talk shop, Susanna. Yeah, oh, yeah I would be very that. curious. We're, yeah, yeah. So um, we don't have any more questions in the chat today. I think I think we can start to wrap things up, but I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to come and read with us and share your experiences. It's been just fantastic to have you. And I really hope that you're able to come and visit and do this in person next oh, time. I would time. love it. Thank you so, so much for having me. This, is, this was my first online reading of the pandemic. So I took a while, <laughs> but, um, and it won't be the last, I hope, but... Um, you know, even though the pandemic is ending, but you know, I think there will be, hopefully it's ending. But yeah. thank you so much. Um, it's just been a, a real pleasure. Yeah, those are doing great work with the series. Thank you. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming to tonight's Bigger Boat reading. Um, and uh, also, like I said, thank you to, to Susanna. She's given us a lot to think about uh, and, and uh, we look forward to having her in person at some point. Um, and we hope to see everybody next at our next reading, April 1st. And so until then, uh, good night and smooth sailing. <laughs>